Hi guys. Um, so I've given this talk previously on traumatic brain injury and ICU management. Uh, it ended up being a little bit long because the anesthetic guys asked for um, a bit of more modification to kind of help prep them for their part two exams with regards to being able to read CT scans as well as interpretation of ICP monitor waves forms um, and uh, as well as waveform trends. So I've split the talk into two. In about two weeks time, we'll do part two. Um, so, so literally what we'll focus on then today is we're gonna look at traumatic brain injury in terms of the epidemiology, the pathology and classification systems of traumatic brain injury. And then we're gonna focus the rest of the talk on just looking at CT scans and the approach of looking at a um, CT brain scan. And then in two weeks time, we'll go into the nitty gritty bits of management of these patients actually that we do admit to ICU and the critical care management of traumatic brain injury. Um, right, so just a little bit of background on the epidemiology of traumatic brain injury and why it's actually important. Um, so obviously I think we all know and from just experience, we know that uh, traumatic brain injury is a major cause of premature death in South Africa. And um, for us, all of, uh, of all our traumatic deaths, 50% are due to traumatic brain injury. And in the patients that do survive, um, there's a, it places a massive burden on their morbidity um, for, for the survivors. In terms of our numbers here at Crudiscia, we admit roughly about 1,000 patients with traumatic brain injury every year to our trauma center. Um, and of those, nearly uh, a quarter to a fifth get admitted to the D13 neurosurgery ICU each year. Um, there was a very interesting unpublished, uh, unfortunately, um, paper that just tried to work out like the direct costs of patients with traumatic brain injury. And if you look at just direct costs for treating these patients that presented, um, and this is already like more than a decade ago now, um, for patients that presented to Kroditsky and Tigerberg, the costs for treating um, TBI the direct costs was 17 and a half million rand, which is like astronomical. And then just also to know like the turnover in ICU for these patients aren't quick. Um, their average length of stay for a patient that requires a neurosurgical intervention, and now this includes either an operation or just insertion of intracranial pressure monitors. Those patients stay on average at least, uh, well, on average 10, 10.2 days. And then if you compare it to the American numbers, obviously their stats are are up to date and you can access that um, much quicker and easier. Um, so they see about 1.7 million people with TBI every year. And of those, about a third of their patients um, with, that die from, from trauma related deaths are caused by TBI. So that's a little bit lower than our 50%. Um, and then they've also got 40% of all incidences of TBI that are caused by accidental falls. And I think if you're going to look at our numbers, ours are more related to uh, interpersonal violence and motor vehicle accidents, whether, not, or whether that's just MVAs or pedestrian vehicle accidents. Um, and then their cost figures are also obviously astronomical. So if you had to classify traumatic brain injury, which is like the, the best way to go about it, we all know that, you know, traumatic brain injuries is a primary injury, which is the irreversible component, and it happens at the time of the, the injury. So it can be focal or diffuse. So it's at the time of the MVA or the assault or the gunshot or the whatever, that it causes either a focal or a diffuse injury. And then f immediately after that secondary injury, kind of starts setting in. And that's actually where we focus um, our efforts is to try and prevent or at least minimize the effects of the secondary injury. Um, and those commonly are intracerebral hematoma. So even though you can't prevent the extradural hematoma from happening, you can treat it very quickly and prevent the consequences or the complications of that extradural hematoma. And obviously these injuries fall on a scale or a continuum um, between from very mild injuries to very, very severe injuries. So classification of traumatic brain injury can be very um, confusing. There's many, many scales and classification systems that people use to classify traumatic brain injury. And that kind of just, it adds to the confusion of it all. Um, so these are just some of the common classification mechanisms people use to classify brain injuries. 
the most common one that we're very comfortable and use every day um, is a clinical classification scale of traumatic brain injury and that we base mainly on um, a patient's Glasgow coma scale um, and we use it because it's also linked to a patient's prognosis and that's well validated and that scale we classify people as either having a mild head injury where their GCS is 13 14 or 15 they can have a moderate head injury with GCS between 9 and 12 or a severe head injury with a GCS between three and eight. Um, and typically, obviously, those patients are usually intubated, and if they are candidates for ICU, they come to ICU with or without intracranial pressure monitors. Some of the other more common um, classification systems we use, you can also um, classify a traumatic brain injury according to the anatomical um, uh, pathology of the, the injury. So you can either have something um, like a focal extradural hematoma or a more diffuse type injury like a diffuse axonal injury or diffuse brain injury uh, and I'll mention that again a little bit later and then you can also have like um, you can describe uh, traumatic brain injuries according to a mechanistic classification system so whether or not the in injury the mechanism of the injury was at high or low velocity and whether or not the injury was a blunt versus a penetrating type injury um, and then there are also radiological classification systems, the most common of which is like the Marshall uh, CT grading of traumatic brain injury. And just for the neurosurgery or the radiology registrars that, um, that listen to this talk, this is just kind of a summary of that for your own reading, just for your exam prep. But just to um, remember that the Marshall CT classification applies actually for a patient that has sustained a traumatic brain injury. And it aims to describe the findings on a CT scan and it goes through six categories, which category one is essentially a normal looking scan, but this is a patient that is clinically has suffered a uh, head injury. So there was loss of consciousness, amnesia, loss of uh, level of consciousness that is low. Um, and then the different categories describe the different pathologies that you can then find on a CT scan. Uh, just a small word in terms of what the difference is between diffuse brain injury versus diffuse axonal injury. So we usually, if you're in a clinical context, you should be speaking about a diffuse brain injury. Um, and usually there's some subtle markers on a CT scan to tell you, well, this pa patient has um, suffered a diffuse brain injury. And that usually um, goes with a low GCS. The patient has numerous um, punctate little hemorrhages in the deep gray uh, white matter, uh, at the interface between uh, gray and white matter. Uh, there's usually some traumatic subarachnoid blood and sometimes you'll even appreciate it in the interpeduncular fossa. And then may or may, uh, you may also be able to appreciate some intraventricular blood as well. Um, and there may or may not be some uh, cerebral swelling with it. A diffuse axonal injury is really a term that we can't really use in the clinical context because it's a diagnosis that you made uh, that gets made on um, forensic post-mortem biopsies where you actually look, uh, a pathologist looks at a slide of brain biopsies and you can actually see the axonal shearing. Um, then you can actually pathologically call it a diffuse axonal injury. So even though this scan means that if you do a biopsy of the, the patient's uh, seg a segment of the brain, you most likely will see these findings with the axonal shearing, which is suggestive of a diffuse axonal injury. So um, this slide kind of just, I wanted to just kick off by saying, you know, traumatic brain injury is really like a complicated pathophysiological course and patients develop complications and um, cellular injury through various mechanisms. But the most important thing about management for these patients with traumatic brain injury is that we want to prevent the secondary um, hit um, and the secondary injury cascade. So we want to, to try and help improve outcomes on these patients. Um, we really want to try and resuscitate these patients and get them treated adequately and timelessly. So then um, I wanted to spend a little bit more time on the CT scans and going through what's normal. And then we'll go through a couple of examples um, of common trauma pathologies on a CT scan. And this is more focused on for the neurosurgery registrars, the trauma registrars, as well as the anesthetic registrars. Um, apparently you guys get asked um, in your part twos um, at your oral exam, you get given CT scans and you're asked for diagnoses and what the best management are for these patients. So um, this is hopefully going to help you prepare for that um, exam as well. So 
Um, there's a nice approach, like an approach that we all got taught in med school to how to read a chest x-ray. <laughs> there's a similarly easy approach to how to read a CT scan. And the most important thing um, just for sidewise is just remember when you're looking at a CT scan, right is always left and left is always right. So because you're looking at a patient's scan almost like from his feet up, like he's lying on a CT scanner bed, um, the left and right is shifted uh, opposite. So I've put that little thingy there. Most important thing for you to understand from a CT scanner, it's essentially um, a fancy x-ray that gets done on multiple slices. Um, from different angles and uh, depending on your CT scanner, um, you'll either have anything from a 0.7 millimeter um, cut to about a five millimeter cut um, uh, of brain slices. The way that CT scanners measure um, radio densities, we measure them with Hounsfield's units. And like I said, it's a measure of the radio density of a substance on a CT scan compared to water. So like pure water on a CT scan would then be zero Hounsfield units. And then you can compare it to different substances or tissues um, and figure out where the scale really goes from minus a thousand to anywhere to about three to 4,000 um, positive, depending on the type of scanner that you have. So we're air in sinuses, so just speaking about CT brain, so air in the air sinuses are roughly about minus 1,000. Bone can be anywhere between plus 300 to plus 1,900, and it just depends on the cancellous cortical bone component of the bone. Um, blood, blood is a little bit trickier because it depends on the acuity of the blood. Where acute brain, that's uh, acute blood, that's only a few hour, been there for a few hours usually is positive about 75 to 100. And as the blood um, ages and the, the calcium in the blood starts to denature, the Hounsfield units will start to drop off. So just on average, the Hounsfield unit for like roughly three day old blood will then drop to about 65 to 85. And about a like a two week old chronic subdural hematoma will have a much lower Hounsfield unit at about 35 to 40. Um, so CSF, very closer to, to pure water, but not quite pure water, has a Hounsfield unit of 15. And then something like fat has a negative Hounsfield unit of 90 to 120. So those are also just like reference points for you. These are things that you can actually measure on a scan. And I'll show you now how I did it. You must just like, I apologize for the quality of the, the photos. So this is how I did it. Um, now recently, just to show you. So if you actually go onto our PAC systems and you, write, you open the, the CT scan, you right click with the mouse and you go to measurements. There's actually a measurement option for you to measure um, in Hounsfield unit with a little circle measurement. And you place your little, um, the mouse click over the area that you wanna measure. So if you wanna check if this is blood or pus or uh, CSF or whatever it may be, you can actually measure the Hounsfield unit. And you can see here, this, this um, intraventricular blood that's over here actually does measure positive 48 Hounsfield units, which tells you, you know, it is blood. It, it is just gonna be a little bit less accurate, the intraventricular blood, because it's also a little bit mixed with CSF. So it's lower than what you would expect for acute blood at about 75 to 100 where this example of this sub, acute subdural hematoma that's starting to undergo some chronic changes over here, um, if you measure it at its most dense area, which I did over here, you find that it's 73 Hounsfield units, and that is in keeping with acute blood. So it's something nice that you can do on a scan yourself. And here I just showed you an example. So I measured the CSF there just for interest's sake, which gives you um, 11, almost 12 Hounsfield units. So also just to know that when you do look at a CT scan, there's different window settings that you can use. Um, obviously, when we look at um, a brain, we want to um, assess the brain in the best possible um, uh, setting, which is then a brain window, which you can also change on the kind of the pack system by clicking the mouse with the right clicky and you can kind of choose if you want to set it at brain windows, bone windows, lung windows, abdominal windows. Um, so obviously when we assess the brain, we put it on brain windows and it will show you um, the pathology in the brain the best. And also it is a good idea to change it to soft tissue. You can appreciate soft tissue injuries of the scalp um, better on soft tissue windows. And then to appreciate um, fractures, 
um, you have to look at the, the bone windows. Like you can appreciate here, the high density of the uh, bone on the brain settings, the calcium is so hyperdense that you can't really, you, you might miss a linear fracture that maybe quite be quite significant and run all the way through the base of the skull just because you can't actually see the fracture line through through the bone or on a brain setting. So that's just kind of the basics of that. So when you actually do look at a CT scan, um, the very first image that you'll get is this little sieve view and it's literally just like a lateral x-ray of the skull and it literally shows you at which levels the CT scanner has taken um, its cuts from. So you can actually also play around a little bit and see um, if you want to look more at the base of the skull or the midbrain um, tonsillar area, you're obviously going to look at the lower cuts and you move your way systematically through, um, through the CT scan. And like I alluded to before, uh, depending a little bit on the type of CT scanner that you've got, um, you can have slices as thin as 0.7 millimeters, which we are lucky enough to have here at Kuriskia. But some of the older machines or software will only give you about five millimeter cuts. And obviously when you're looking at something like a brain, you can miss a contusion if your slices are five millimeters thick. Um, so for definitely, I think for the brain scan, I would say the thinner slices that's available, the better. And it also helps us when we want to do any multiplanar reconstructions uh, and looking at coronal and sagittal views, all of that is just software manipulation from the axial scans. And obviously, if you've got very thick slices, then your axial and your coronal um, multiplanar reconstructions look a little bit hazy. Um, whereas if you use the very thin slices, you get a nice crisp, clear picture and you can appreciate pathology from different views. Um, and then the helical imaging of CT angiograms we, we use when we, we're doing CTA of the head and neck, uh, as well as the same technique gets used when they're doing CTA of vessels for the rest of the body. Okay, so also similarly to like uh, having approach for looking at chest x-rays, CT scans are no different. So um, it's always good if you try and start off by assessing what is normal anatomical structures and you choose your best optimal uh, window setting for the type of tissue that you are trying to assess. Um, so once you're happy, you've looked at everything that you think should be normal, you can go on and focus a little bit more on underlying pathology, which in trauma is, is often very obvious. So the massive extradural or the massive subdural or the infarct that's there is going to jump out at you. Um, then also it is important to also evaluate change to a bone setting and look at not only if you can see um, fractures, but if you can see any fracture lines running through the air sinuses, assess the base of skull, which is often a little bit difficult in the beginning um, because you don't actually know what suture lines, what's normal foramina uh, and what's actually fracture lines. And the more you get used to it, the more you can actually spot the pathology um, in the base of the skull as well. And then last, uh, it's always a good idea to just run through a soft tissue um, window as well and assess all the extracranial anatomy. So commonly look at the orbits, the rest of the face, as well as the scalp. If you don't appreciate a bone, um, bone fracture, one of the um, things, little tip that I can give you is to change it to a soft tissue window and see if there's scalp swelling. Just uh, look at that bone fragment again or um, that uh, underlying skull there and assess it carefully that you're not missing a linear fracture there. So just going through um, normal CT brain scan, starting at the base of the skull, um, I've tried to use some of these slides because they've got nice colored arrows going through. So you can appreciate over here. Um, so just remember again, I'm gonna remind you, right is left and left is right. So this would be the right side of the patient. This would be the left side of the patient. Um, and then you can already at the base of the skull start to appreciate um, the cerebellar uh, hemispheres coming into view with the start of the fourth ventricle um, and the medulla coming into view over here. That's a nice prepontine cistern, which we don't always appreciate, especially in a patient with severe traumatic brain injury with brain swelling. Um, it's one of the nice places to look at if you think that there's a, a possible herniation that's already occurred. Um, air sinuses should always be nice and clear. They get filled up with gray guck when um, there's chronic sinusitis or in trauma cases, um, most likely filled with blood. Um, 
just moving up a little bit to the level of the ponds. Uh, you can now appreciate nicely the fourth ventricle in view. Um, the fourth ventricle is a nice thing to look at because it'll also start to give you a clue if there's mass effect in the posterior fossa. So if there might be a, uh, an extra dural or a small subdural, which is not that common in the posterior fossa, um, Often, especially if it's a little, if the injury is a few days old, you may miss it because it, the density of the older blood might uh, be very similar to the density of the brain. Um, and often, uh, you know, radiologists and neurosurgeons and trauma doctors miss it. Um, but if you look at the fourth ventricle, it could give you a clue as if, um, if there's mass effect or midline shift of the fourth ventricle with effacement. And again, you can appreciate here the prepontine cistern of CSF, and then here the temporal, uh, the tips of the temporal lobes are starting to come into view. Uh, and then the big black hole here is the this, uh, the sphenoid sinus that you can uh, appreciate. That's going to lead you all up, uh, all the way up to the pituitary fossa if you follow it uh, cranially. So then, moving one level up again to the midbrain level, you can appreciate the midbrain over here. Um, within the aqueduct, the cerebral aqueduct, right here in the middle, which sometimes get obstructed with pathologies and it's one of the causes for obstructive hydrocephalus. Um, you can also start to appreciate the, the temporal horns of the lateral ventricles a little bit more maybe on the right than on the left, um, as well as the supracellar cisterns of CS, uh, CSF cisterns that are coming into view here. And then just here about on the lateral edges, the sylvian fissures are gonna start coming into view as well. Um, uh, coming up again furthermore, you can also appreciate now the sylvian fissures here on the side, um, coming up more superiorly. The third ventricle that is usually nice and um, oval shaped or like a thin flat oval, it should never be round. Um, it usually, when it rounds out, it usually is an indicator that, they, that, that there may be hydrocephalus. Um, and then you've also got the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles coming into view. You've got the quadrigeminal plate cistern of CSF um, here at the back of the midbrain as it comes up. Uh, and then you've also got frontal lobes, temporal lobes, parietal lobes, occipital lobes are now too low um, to, to appreciate on this slice. Uh, and then again, just look at your midline, make sure that it's nice and central. Um, so those are things that you can look at for here. And here also you can appreciate, because these are now normal scans, you can appreciate the sulcal markings with the gyri. So you can actually see, you know, that nice normal brain, you know, sulcal and gyral architecture on the CT scan that, that you often, uh, you can't appreciate in a patient that's sustained a severe head injury because of severe cerebral swelling. Um, so coming up just a little bit further, now you can see the lateral ventricular system nicely. So the lateral ventricle um, on the left and the lateral ventricle on the right, frontal horns, occipital horns, um, Sylvian fissure again on the side, and then the third ventricle that's coming up, where it actually, this is the foramen of Monroe, that uh, the lateral ventricles actually connect into the third ventricle. Um, and then you can also appreciate um, other structures um, on the CT scan. It's probably not as important for a TBI talk, but just for the neurosurgery registrars listening, you can already appreciate globus pallidus. You can appreciate the putamen. Um, you can appreciate the thalamus over here. And often when we see big um, contusions over there, then you know we usually are very worried uh, about the patient's prognosis. And then also this little speck of calcium in there that you can see in a... Uh, the pineal gland. So lots that you can actually appreciate on a CT scan. This is just one cut higher um, and all I actually just want to show you here is you can appreciate actually the choroid plexus uh, in the lateral ventricle and again um, thalamus with uh, external capsule that runs between the insular cortex and this is the part of the insula. Um, and the putamen of the basal ganglia. So you can actually appreciate the basal ganglia here as well with the thalamus and the lateral, lateral ventricular system and a nice normal midline. So no, no sneaky underlying sub, uh, subdural that, that you may or may not miss. This is also just one slice higher. Uh, all I wanted to show here is that you can appreciate even white matter tracts on a CT scan. So 
when we talk in trauma terms from loss of gray and white matter differentiation, so in CT scan, the white matter is actually the darker gray and the, the gray matter is actually the lighter gray. So, but you can see that there's a, there's a very clear distinction between white matter, uh, our gray matter here, and the white matter tracts that run deeper. Um, and if you can make that distinction, you know, it's, it's less likely that you've got somebody with a severe diffuse brain injury where you've got loss of gray white matter differentiation. And then a uh, midline little white structure here is actually the um, superior sagittal sinus. And because there's acute blood running into it, uh, it's more hyperdense and you can appreciate that over there. Um, and then just also more towards the vertex of the head, um, just to appreciate more, again, the sulcal and gyral markings, the difference between the, the gray matter and the white matter tracts, midline nice and central, and you can see nice CSF um, filling in the sulcal markings of the brain. Um, again, here, you, you don't appreciate this architecture in somebody that's sustained a severe head injury with severe cerebral swelling. You don't, you don't see all of this nice uh, anatomy. Uh, and then at the very top, just for the neurosurgery registrars, you can look at this, but this is just a nice scan to tell you uh, which sulcus is where and where the motor strip is, where the sensory strip is. And the central sulcus is always much further back than what people think it is. This is over here with the blue arrow. People always think that it's this prefrontal sulcus, but that's actually prefrontal. This is the central sulcus making this the motor strip and that the sensory strip. Um, so that's essentially just a 101 of how I usually go about looking at a normal CT brain. Um, and you guys are welcome to ask some questions when we're done or just raise your hand and I'll try and, and answer. But then just a few common pathologies on CT scan. And I think the anesthesia guys, you get asked extradurals and subdurals in your, in your part twos is, is what com commonly comes up for you guys. So we'll run through very quickly um, some common trauma um, scans. So the first one over here is a scan of contusions. Um, and I'm going to go through each one individually um, again after. This is an example of an extradural uh, hematoma. This is a, an example of a chronic subdural hematoma with significant, significant midline shift and entrapment hydrocephalus. This is more an acute subdural hematoma, although it's starting to undergo some um, chronic changes. This is, so this is not a trauma scan, but I just thought I, this is the best example I've got. Um, these are all of Kruderskia patients that I've used scans. So these are our own scans on our own packs. Um, this is an example of subarachnoid hemorrhage. And I just wanted to show you how actually the subarachnoid hemorrhage from an aneurysmal rupture actually fills all of those normal CSF cisternal spaces. So the whole prepontine, quadrigeminal cyst, supracellar cistern of, of CSF spaces get filled then with the subarachnoid blood. Um, this is an example um, of an intracerebral hemorrhage with um, intraventricular um, blood. This we often also get confronted in, in a trauma setting, but this is actually not a trauma-related um, uh, hematoma. This is actually a patient that's had uncontrolled hypertension, has had a massive hypertensive ble bleed, and it's broken through the uh, ependymal layer into the intraventricular system, but obviously this patient presented to trauma because the patient then had a collapse. So it's always, you know, it's the kind of the chicken versus the egg scenario. Um, this is just an example of severe cerebral swelling. So that's that architecture that I've been going on and on about. So you can't actually appreciate any gray white matter differentiation here. You can't see any sulcal markings. You can't see the sylvian fissure. You can't see the prepontine cisterns. Um, you can't even see the fourth ventricle. All the CSF spaces have been squeezed out by this severe cerebral swelling. Um, and the last one, I just always like seeing this as like a little meniscus layer. This is an acute on chronic subdural hematoma. Um, and we'll, we'll go through all of these um, pathophysiological processes very quickly. So in terms of the contusions, I always try and teach the, the neurosurgical registrars that the contusions often in a high velocity setting where the brain has undergone um, or was exposed to very high acceleration, deceleration injury. Um, you typically see these very large contusions in the distribution of the temporal and the frontal lobes. And if you actually have a look at the 
um, inner anatomy of the skull um, from the inside, you can actually appreciate often on the posterior fossa or the higher like frontal and parietal lobes where the skull is nice and smooth, that acceleration, deceleration, you can get contusions there. But often the contusions you're going to see on the floor of the, the, anterior, uh, the anterior cranial fossa, which is the frontal lobes where they sit, as well as the temporal lobes, because you can see the middle cranial fossa actually dips down and it's lower and it's got a very rough interior surface. So it's almost like you, like imagining you skidding your knee on like gravel. It's a very rough surface and any acceleration, deceleration causes contusions in that distribution. Um, moving on to an extradural hematoma. Um, so the, the pathophysiology be, behind an extradural hematoma, most of the time the extradural hematomas are arterial in, in, um, in nature. And if you see them in this distribution, you can almost bet your life that the, um, the extradural hematoma is arising from the middle meningeal artery, uh, which comes up through the base of the skull through the foramen spinosum. Uh, and the reason why the extradural hematoma is also lens shaped is because it's actually bleeding from uh, uh, the middle meningeal that runs on the inside of the skull uh, in an extradural space. And the dura is actually attached on the inside to these suture lines. Um, and as the bleeding from the middle meningeal that runs up here comes in frame and spinosum and actually runs in this type of pattern, um, it, it will expand the hematoma until it gets to its atta dural attachments of um, the, the skull suture lines. And then it will continue to expand in a medial um, uh, trajectory and cause massive mass effect. And because it's an arterial bleed, um, the mass effect can go up quite rapidly. Um, and these are the patients that we really rush to theater because theoretically speaking, if you get them into theater soon enough, um, these are patients that if you've done a good job, you can potentially send them home the next day with no neurological consequence or deficit. Um, the acute subdural hematoma, however, is, is a very different story. An acute subdural hematoma, again, for the majority of the time, I'm not saying that you know, an extradural hematoma can't be venous, um, they, they very much can, but it's just the majority of them are arterial bleeds, where the majority of an acute subdural hematoma will be a venous bleed. And it's because of um, the, the nature under the, the dura runs the, on the surface of the, the brain, you've got cortical vessels. And as the cortical vessels come across and they actually drain into the arachnoid granulations, um, they actually have to cross this potential subdural space. Uh, and that's also why subdural hematomas are more commonly seen in elderly pa patients with um, less trauma or minor falls. Um, and, it's, and it's often the, the elderly patient that's been on warfarin for AF um, for a very long time with a very minor bump to their head because their subdural space is so much bigger. Um, they just need a small uh, hit, uh, bump to their head to tear one of these bridging cortical veins. Um, the acute subdural hematoma, though, in a young trauma patient is usually also linked to a poorer prognosis in terms of from a, from a TBI recovery point. And that's purely just because you expect in a younger patient to have a fuller brain, if I can call it that, um, uh, and their subdural space is a much sp smaller space. And the force that you need, again, to cause that acceleration, deceleration motion that's enough to tear a bridging cortical vein has to be quite a significant amount of, of trauma. Um, so it's not really uh, the bleed that, that is linked to the, the prognosis. It's more the force that was necessary to cause this type of bleed in a young patient that actually... Um, uh, is also associated then with underlying diffuse brain injury um, mechanisms. Um, chronic subdural hematoma, more often seen in um, elderly patients because they have a larger subdural space. Um, they usually also take time to accumulate. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I did want to stress here, so as the blood kind of um, denatures, it undergoes this chronic um, changes and the um, 
the, the acute blood starts to lose its hyperdensity. It becomes isodense to brain and then eventually it becomes hypodense to brain. So darker than brain. So this one is kind of the, the top bit here is, is more chronic. The bottom bit I would say is more isodense. So this is still almost like an acute uh, subdural hematoma that's now undergone chronic changes and it's uh, starting to become more a chronic subdural hematoma. One thing that I did want to stress here is I absolutely hate the name chronic subdural hematoma because it translates to most clinicians thinking, especially neurosurgery, registrars or MOs starting off or um, junior anesthetic um, MOs that's starting off. The moment you hear chronic in anything, you kind of assume that it's been there for a long time and it's not as urgent on the emergency board. Um, and a lot of like disagreements um, arise from why are you booking this chronic subdural hematoma as an orange or a red. The important thing to know though, is that when a patient eventually presents with symptoms from a chronic subdural hematoma, that patient is usually at the limit of their compensation. So they've already shunted as much CSF out of the normal systems that they could. And they now are starting to present with headaches, vomiting that's worsening. And it's because of this herniation that's starting to occur. So there's going to be sub sign herniation. There's potentially going to be uncle herniation. So this patient is literally now presented at, at his physiological reserve end. So that's why, you know, these patients then end up being booked as an orange or a red. The acute on chronic subdural hematomas, <laughs> the ones that I <laughs> said I like a lot because you can see this little uh, meniscus line here. And this is just how um, the, the blood denatures. And you can almost equate it exactly to when you draw blood um, for a full blood count and you let it lie for a while or let it stand. You'll see that, you know, the red cell mass that's heavier will start to actually um, uh, uh, form sediment at the bottom and you get these two components here. Um, so, which is always very interesting to see. And that's just the, the aging of an acute subdural hematoma. The other thing that it can allude to though, is that this patient may have had, so let's say this is a 75 or an 80 year old granny that is on warfarin and she had a knock, she knocked her head against the kitchen counter two weeks ago and she was complaining of headaches since then, um, but she was slowly getting better. The other thing that this could mean is if she knocks her head again, this is now a second acute bleed. So this could be either just a, a, a subacute um, subdural hematoma that's starting to sediment out and it's undergoing chronic changes, or it was actually a complete chronic subdural hematoma and now it's had a second re-bleed episode. Um, the subarachnoid hemorrhage, I just wanted to show this picture and kind of explain to you why this blood distribution is in the pattern that it is. And you often appreciate it in the um, supracellar uh, CSF cisterns around the pituitary and the cellar area, as well as around the midbrain. And the pre and it'll go down all the way to the prepontine and even um, extend into the sylvian fissures. Um, and if you look at where, how the circle of Willis, kind of the internal carotid and the vertebral arteries join up to the the basal and run into actually the sylvian fissures um, to then supply the brain and send in um, all the perforating yeah. arteries. The aneurysms usually sit uh, in a location at the bifurcation and that's in the CSF spaces. So if aneurysms rupture there, you'll have this distribution of, of blood um, uh, pattern. Uh, the intracerebral hematoma and intraventricular hemorrhage. Um, you can actually tell a lot about the etiology of a bleed just by looking at its location. So this one I told you, this one was a little bit more tricky to figure out just because the patient presented as a history of a fall um, with this massive intracerebral hemorrhage with a break through the ependymal layer and into the intraventricular space. But this is actually a, a common origin point in the basal ganglia for a hypertensive bleed. They can sometimes be so catastrophic and so big that you can't actually see it as nicely as, for example, this one here, which is also in the basal ganglia area towards the thalamus, uh, also a very typical location for a hypertensive type bleed. So if the patient's the right age, over 45, and they're known with hypertension or um, and they come in with this type of bleed, you can quite safely say, you know, it is a complication from long-standing uncontrolled hypertension, um, and this is a hypertensive bleed. Whereas this type of bleed is a lot more peripheral um, or superficial cortical area, this would make me very worried depending on the history that was given. Um, 
that this is actually, um, if this wasn't trauma and there was no, no history of any traumatic injury, I would be very worried about a hemorrhagic uh, metastatic lesion. So the location of the bleed often will also tell you um, a lot. Cerebral swelling, um, just again to show you a couple of things. Um, this I've more put um, also just for registrars to review, but just remember you can get cerebral swelling in terms of, you can get it in focal areas versus global areas. Um, and you can get it also on a spectrum from very mild cerebral swelling to very severe, which in this case, um, you've got examples of very severe swelling with herniation and um, herniation syndrome. Uh, in both this scan and the, the one at the bottom here. Um, and what I wanted to show in the bottom here is actually, uh, it didn't go all the way down, but what we call like the white cerebellar syndrome, so or sparing of the cerebellum. So you've got complete like this dark cerebral hemispheres, um, which we often see in patients that have already herniated, but sparing of the cerebellum. Um, just because of the blood supply coming from the posterior circle of Willis, um, you, you often see sparing of the cerebellum in these herniation syndromes. And just remember that you can also get focal cerebral um, swelling over areas of um, brain uh, injury as well. Uh, it doesn't always have to just be the whole brain. Um, and then again, just secondary injury. Um, we try our very best to prevent, um, I've already spoken about, um, you know, the extradural patients that we really do try and rush to theater. They are the red cases that we book. And these patients can be GCS 15 out of 15 and be dead five minutes later. They are typically the patients that sustain an injury to the head um, and they wake up, they have a very short period of um, loss of consciousness. They wake up and they have a normal com conversation with you and then a few minutes later they're dead. Um, so they often are described to have this lucid interval and we've already spoken about the arterial bleeding. Um, and I've already mentioned these patients, we're quite aggressive with their management because they are, they are the patients that if we get to them in time, they have a very good prognosis. And like I said, I'm not... Um, uh, being funny when I'm saying like we literally can usually send these patients, discharge them back home um, to their normal lives the next day. Um, so uh, we've already gone through the secondary injury with acute subdural hematomas and how they're associated with uh, diffuse brain injury and that the majority of them are venous bleeding and why they are associated with poor prognosis. Um, and I've already told you why I hate the naming of chronic subdural um, pathology on CT scans uh, as they are. Um, again, here, um, just looking at uh, secondary injury in terms of cerebral ischemia, this is a much nicer um, CT scan image of the cerebellar sparing that I was talking about. Um, and this we often see in patients that have sustained hypoxic brain injuries or have had a prolonged period of hypertension. We see the sparing of the posterior circulation um, and the, this complete dark cerebral hemispheres. Um, and just to kind of remember, there's many ways that um, secondary brain injury happens um, after uh, an insult. So um, we've got neuronal death and tissue loss that occurs um, in areas of ischemia or hypoxia. We've got loss of autoregulation. Uh, we can have blood-brain barrier breakdown with um, secondary uh, swelling and edema. I'm going to tell you now that there is actually a difference between those two when we talk about traumatic brain injuries. And then you've also you've got, you enter in this vicious cycle where um, gliosis start to occur, which is the process by which the brain tries to heal. And because the brain cells can't regenerate themselves um, for the most majority of it, um, the, the brain heals by scarring, uh, which we call gliosis. Um, and there's uh, upregulation of inflammatory mediators as well during the whole acute phase of a traumatic brain injury. Um, so <laughs> the pathophysiology, however, of secondary brain injury is, is very complex. It's not fully understood. There's a lot of ongoing research with it, especially with microanalysis, um, looking at cellular uh, damage markers, and it is a complete lecture on its own um, uh, just by itself. Um, I've already mentioned all the different types of um, mechanisms that secondary injury gets driven um, by. So there's not only oxidative stress, but the disruption of the blood-brain barrier, as I've mentioned, the inflammatory cascades and processes that's ongoing. And that usually feeds the excitotoxicity as well and leads to even more cell death. 
Um, just wanted to show you a picture of what actually cerebral swelling looks like. So in the setting of traumatic brain injury, um, normally your brain, the sulcal markings are, are often these nice deep sulcal markings with normal diary that you can appreciate. And it actually looks like, you know, just a worm kind of curled up and you can appreciate the architecture of it uh, nicely. This is an example of a more atrophied brain. So you can see the sulcal markings much deeper and you can see the gyri are not as full as the picture um, above here. And then the picture on the left actually depicts like a severely swollen brain. So you've got loss of autoregulation here, hyperemia that's filled the brain and just uh, pushed up the intracranial pressure um, quite severely and significantly. So then just to kind of explain nicely what is the difference when we speak about cerebral swelling and cerebral edema, people use the terms often interchangeably. But when you talk about trauma, they're actually, they, they kind of allude to two different processes that are happening. When, you, when we're talking about cerebral swelling, what we actually mean is that there's hyperemia and loss of autoregulation or loss of autoregulation that leads to hyperemia. And the, the brain is, loses its ability to vasoconstrict and vasocontract to kind of control the intracranial pressure. Um, where cerebral edema kind of alludes to this situation where you've got increase in the interstitial water of the brain and that's due to many many processes so there's uh, various types of cerebral edema that uh, you get um, so vasogenic um, uh, toxic uh, induced and that that can be a focal process or a, um, a, gl a, a diffuse global process uh, in the setting of trauma, you often see cerebral edema, so the increase in interstitial uh, water around contusions, where you've got breakdown of cellular um, membrane integrity and you've got this leakage of cerebral uh, water um, uh, in the interstitium. Um, so that was a mouthful for today, but that's basically the basis of what we're going to then build on for part two, when we're going to talk about the actual management of these patients in, in ICU. But um, yeah, thanks for letting me present.